something fairly high, it's difficult, but they do it in any way. It's also here, ironically, almost a century ago, that the first land trekkers came through from Southwest Africa into Angola. They crossed northwards, stayed a while, and then came back here. It seems strange that you can travel through an arid waste such as this and then suddenly come around a bend in the mountain and be confronted by these magnificent Makalani palms. So it was at Apupa. But for its isolation, this waterfall would probably be one of the tourist attractions of the subcontinent. For the spectacle on the Lower Canine is quite incredible. It's also dangerous. One of the troops stationed here drowned in these rapids the day before we reached the falls. One doesn't want to be too explicit about the mountains. They're fairly obvious here in the Cocoa Felt. You've had experience in the east, uh, Caprivia of Umberland. How is this terrain changed the nature of the war, the guerrilla war? Well, the uh, prime consideration in this particular area is the water problem, which is fairly universal as far as we're concerned. We have had recently um, fairly heavy falls of rain, but the rain doesn't soak in, washes away. Uh, here and there you'll get a little pool, mostly in rock areas, but otherwise you have a very dry arid area such as we are in at the moment. This water is uh, also of consideration in moving people around. We must also bear in mind that the enemy also moves from uh, water hole to water hole. He's as dependent on water as we are. And I would say here this is one of the biggest factors that govern the planning in this area. So can't you place men at every water hole? Well, if we consider the uh, frequency of springs in this immediate area, um, <clears throat> I would say that we have here in the region of um, 10 to 15 good springs, springs that support human life continually throughout the dry period. Um, if we had to cover each one of those, we would become totally static. And um, in order to contain your enemy and to define his areas of operation you must be mobile and you must move through the area. And what is the modus operandi as far as guerrilla conflict is concerned? Um, here in Kaukoland we have a completely different approach to the uh, normal intimidation as we call it. It's a very soft intimidation. Um, he has not gone to the strong arm tactics that he has further east from here. But, um, he still lays the landmines? Uh, as far as that, I consider that as an offensive action against the security forces. He still murders the odd tribal head? Um, the odd tribal head is yeah, murdered, yes, but the, it's on a completely different scale where um, the, the major incidents here have been kidnap attempts. And I feel that these are attempts in order to get um, soldiers on their own side who know this area and who can act as guides for later operations. From the local Himba people? From the local Himba people, yes. Perhaps because of their extended isolation, these Himba people, who consider themselves a sub-tribe of the more developed Hereros, can be regarded as among the less developed communities in southern Africa. We try to pay these men for taking their pictures, but they had no use for cash. Traditions within the tribe, such as this woman's finery, run deep. All domestic activity is centered on the kraal, where children seem to dominate social activity with an almost Western level of indulgence. How else in a community where wealth is measured solely in terms of what you can see about you? No exception is the Indian Ocean cone shell. In tribal terms, they are valuable, but are no longer brought into the territory by Portuguese traders since the demise of Lisbon's African empire. The men also have traditions to maintain, such as the headdress worn by those who are married. From that day, the hair is never cut nor is it washed. It is covered by a turban with a short length of prodding iron used for scratching the scalp. One of the interesting observations made by several visitors over the years was the often distinct similarity in tradition and culture between the Ovahimba people and the equally primitive Turkana tribe of northern Kenya, who incidentally live in the same type of isolated terrain along the shores of Lake Rulof. I was struck by parallels such as in headdress beads worn by women and children, 
ochre-covered leather aprons and thongs, and even the use of butterfat for decoration. That both the Himba and the Turkana should rate comparison at all, separated as they are by half the length of Africa, is significant. Certainly, it underscores the migration theory espoused by anthropologists over the years. Even their diet, meat taken only occasionally, and much of the bulk consisting of meal covered by milk, laced with curdling agents, is not dissimilar. Trust in local authority seems to run deep, and this could be as a result of the war. At most in Darbas, some of the men wore army fatigues. Much of the intelligence apparently needed by the security forces comes from these Himba people. Quite a few of the tribal rites followed by this community are secret. One of these, very rarely witnessed by the white man, is a Himba funeral. We needed special permission from the headman to move into the occasion with a camera. A village elder had died. He lay surrounded by the women and children of the community. And although he had only died the previous night and was to be buried not many hours afterwards, Kaukaland's heat allows for no alternative. As is customary, the man buried in a kraal which was then abandoned. It became holy ground. The rest of the community afterwards moved on to a new area. Young men of the village have no part in the proceedings, except to hang around the periphery until the funeral is over. These are the braves, or fighting men, of the Ovahimba, some of whom have been captured and abducted by Swapu to be used as trackers and guides when they return with the terrorist forces at night. The hair of the unmarried tribesmen is distinctly styled into a pigtail which hangs down the back of the neck. There is no explanation to this trend, except that it is also followed by some smaller East African tribes. The ongoing conflict has provided dividends of another sort. Although the Himba people have never been prohibited from carrying weapons, largely because so many of them hunt, the war has injected a new dimension into the fray, automatic and semi-auto carbines of a type used almost solely for defense. These men were mustered as a guard of honor to attend the funeral. They had been trained by the army to defend the village and had apparently had two contacts in the past year, both of which had succeeded in driving off terrorists. It's in terrain like this that the Himba fight, for this is the land to which they are accustomed, but not always those who fight with them. South African and South West African troops, like these colored soldiers from 101 Battalion, sometimes find that patrols in these mountains can be as tiring as they are soul-destroying. For contact with Swapu is not as routine as it is in parts of neighboring Obombaland. Mostly Swapu elements come across the Kanini River from Angola at night, lay their landmines or abduct the occasional villager, and then return to the sanctuaries before dawn. On this occasion, however, our visit had coincided with a major South African strike against a group of more than 250 terrorists in a base directly to the north. Operation Super, as it was codenamed, thwarted a major terrorist invasion southwards towards this corner of the country. It would have been a significant new phase in the insurgent war. As it was, it never happened. Ovomberland, Kaukofelt, or even Caprivi routines on the march are all the same, at least when it comes to a break. <laughs> European strategists used to talk about an army fighting on its stomach. True. But in places along the Angolan border is an additional element that is even more important. As far as South African forces are concerned, it's mail from home that makes the world go round. Captain Dave, as intelligence officer of Kokofeld, uh, you might be able to answer this in that it has often been said that Kokofeld subscribes to the ten principles of Chairman Mao's uh, concept of guerrilla warfare. How do you see this? Yeah, that's, that's quite correct. 
going back to, I think, to Chairman Mao's initial, his initial idea of terrain, in your trip around you, you've obviously seen the terrain is very much, the enemy has the advantage of the terrain, specifically in the mountainous areas and the very limited infrastructure. We as such, we as, as the security forces are limited to only to certain roads. The war's been going on here now for a couple of years. Correct. If all these factors considered together are correct, you should have been able to achieve some success in driving them out permanently. That's a rather difficult question. I, I'm inclined to agree with you there. However, having seen the terrain, the, the problems of mobility, the problems of air support and such, it's very difficult to eliminate small groups and specifically to locate them in the mountainous area. How many terrorists do you think have been killed over the last two years that the wars lasted? In our specific in area? Kokofeld, Kokoland, yeah. Roughly? I think roughly, giving you a pure guesstimate, would be a uh, total confirmed kill would be uh, in two figures. In Kaokaland, the roads that there are all lead to Apuro, the capital. It's not a big town, but its role in that region is crucial as an administrative and economic center. It also suffers from some of the disadvantages of being the center of a developing region. With progress have come many of the negative factors of a contemporary society, of which liquor unfortunately rates a priority. Issues have been exacerbated by two additional factors. The war, which for the past two years has prevented unrestricted movement into the interior because of landmines, as well as the temporary resettling of thousands of Himba people from affected areas. The resultant shift of population to the area around Apuo resulted in the overnight establishment of dozens of squatter camps. It's only natural, perhaps, that alcohol should have supplemented many of the social mores which made this such a close-knit little community in the past. In other respects, Apuo is a pleasant little backwater, splendid in its isolation. The hospital is modern, so is the treatment. The post office functions, as does the magistrate's court. The school is the biggest, catering exclusively for black people between Oshikati and the Atlantic Ocean to the west. From the primitive mountains of the north to the domesticity of organized education in the capital, the road is a long one. But it's a problem not unique to Kaokaland, for progress takes time. Living in the war zone has its contrasts. Until recently, these children went by road to school at Ochu, almost 400 kilometers to the south. Now, once a month, the Air Force takes them in and out. In one sense, the threat is diminished. In another, it brings home the reality of conflict in a region that until very recently was regarded as one of the remotest in all of Africa. <laughs>